I'm going to be talking about the strategies to reverse the neglect of tropical snake bite victims and introduce that topic by describing to you that there are two main groups of snakes, the elapids, these are the mambas, the cobras, the crates, coral snakes, that primarily cause a neuromuscular paralysis, um, here ptosis in, in a victim of, of a black mamba, and then you've got the vipers, the pit vipers, and the adders, and so on, and they primarily cause uh, uh, cardiovascular effects, bleeding, sometimes coagulopathy, sometimes hypovolemic shock, and the antivenom can be a very effective treatment for either of these pathologies as a consequence of snake bite. Antivenom is, is a drug that's been around in, in its essence for over 100 years, hasn't changed that much. And essentially, what you do is you take the venom from a snake, you lyophilize that, and then you resuspend it in, in the required amounts, very subtoxic amounts, and inject that into, intradermally into, into horses or sheep. And you do that on numerous occasions until you get a, a state of hyperimmunization. Once the animals have seroconverted to that venom immunization, you then harvest the blood here from, from uh, horses and <coughs> colleagues of ours in Costa Rica. And then the process, the expensive process, is, is purifying the IgG from the blood. And that is the drug. So it's IgG from hyperimmunized animals. So antivenom, in many ways, is, is, is provides the tool to, to control snake bite. And, but despite that, despite the fact that it's been around for over 100 years, we have over 100,000 100, people dying from snake bite every year. And so this is the global snake bite mortality map. Remarkable coincidence with, with the yours map we've just seen now, just previously. Um, and also, you look at any NTD, it's the same map. It's the same people that suffer snake bite, that suffer all these other neglected tropical diseases. Um, we do know from various studies that these are wildly inaccurate, probably greatly underestimated, because they're mostly hospital-based data. A lot of snake bite victims never get to hospital. If their deaths are not recorded in hospital-based data, we don't capture that. So it could be as many as three times that. We don't know. So one of the recommendations is to improve the, the snake bite disease burden uh, accuracy by getting data from community-based studies and also to, to capture the socioeconomic burden of snake bite. And we'll go through that a bit more detail later. It's absolutely clear that most snake bites uh, deaths occur in Africa and Asia. Uh, and the question is, is, is why is that, uh, given that antivenom is, is, is so effective or can be so effective? And why is it, in particular, that African snake bite victims suffer the highest case fatality rate? So twice the number of people die from snake bite in Africa than they do in Asia, and nearly fourfold that in, in Latin America. What is the reason for that? And it's partly this. This is a study that we did some time ago, just looking at the, the global data and, and uh, dividing it up by countries with various indices um, related to poverty. And so here you can see the snake bite mortality, and those countries with the highest snake bite mortality spend the least on health per person. Those countries with the highest snake bite mortality have the lowest quality of life indices. This is really significant data, very statistically significant data. Um, and so it's for that reason, we describe snake bite as a tropical disease of rural poverty. And it causes very high mortality and very uh, high levels of, of disability. So in the context of other tropical diseases, Snake bite annually kills one-fifth the number of people that are dying from malaria every year. It, half the number of people that are dying from HIV in India are dying from snake bite. What's very significant about that is those tropical diseases have extraordinary support, and thank goodness they do, from international health agencies. Snake bite receives no support from any of those international health agencies, including the WHO, DFID, the EU, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have tried several times to get them involved. It's not happening. We don't know why. Is it because snake bite is not eradicable? Don't know. But it's also neglected by many of the tropical governments whose 
people are suffering from, who are, who are dying from this. And that's something that we're trying to, to reverse, uh, and one of the reasons that I'm here giving this talk. So the question then is, is it something to do with the people that makes them different that are suffering from these other neglected tropical diseases? And the answer is really no. So an example of the a community is where we're working in, in, in Nigeria, in northeast Nigeria, in, in Gombe State. The, the landscape is dominated by the savanna that's either used for subsistence uh, farming or for cattle grazing. And it's the poverty-induced systems that create the, the risk to snake bite. So these communities cannot afford mechanized agricultural equipment, tractors, plows, and so on. They, they hoe the land with adzes or jembies, as they're called. They can't afford boots that would protect them from most snake bites in this area. Flip-flops is the norm. Probably more comfortable in the, in the heat as well. The way they store their grain is, is sensible. It takes it away from the chickens and, 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 and the goats and so on, but it doesn't stop the rats getting up in there, and then snakes follow the rats, and then so when the, the, the farmer comes to the harvest, he's at risk from snake bite. Their homes offer very little if any protection to, to ingress of snakes. In fact, that thatch is perfect environment for, for rodents. Rodents attract snakes. And in, in Africa particularly, sometimes snakes can be very hard to see. Um, there's a snake in here, a very dangerous snake, the most dangerous snake of Africa, but you can't see it um, because it's so well camouflaged, it's so small. But it kills more people than any other snake in Africa. So it's no surprise that subsistence farmers are at the greatest risk from, from snake bite, and they get bitten here all from Nigeria on primarily the, the feet and also the hands. Um, and this is an example why never to use tourniquet as a first aid treatment for snake bite because it can result in amputations because it restricts the, the venom necrosis into one area. Um, the next, sorry, uh, and Permanent disfigurement as a result of snake bite tissue necrosis is not at all uncommon. Children are the next highest risk group, so these two young lads were, were putting their hands down rat holes to try and have some, play, have some fun. They both got bitten by, by snakes because the snakes were following the rats. Um, this girl was uh, showing the signs of, of coagulopathic, uh, coagulopathy as a result of the source scale viper bite. Um, all survived uh, well. This is a, a four-month-old girl in, in Kaltunga, northeast North Nigeria, bitten in the kitchen of the house by a huge puff adder. Puff adders are, deliver vast amounts of venom that are very necrotic. Um, and you can see the, the, the airways here in this young girl are, are at extreme risk, irrespective of what the toxins are doing. But the, the physician there, Dr. Abu Bakr, was able to pull this child through primarily by taking a lot of the scalp away by debriding it. Um, but the point is that, that in this particular hospital where we're providing an antivenom, and I'll talk to you about that, it can be dramatically effective, a really positive drug. This is the little girl two days later, treated expertly by Dr. Abu Bakr, and obviously very, very uh, well on the way to recovery. Snake bite is in the top 10 causes of hospital admissions in Ghana. Um, in some hospitals, 70% 70, 70 of beds are occupied by snake bite victims. Many of my colleagues would say, Rob, that's rubbish. I took pictures of the register, pages and pages and pages. It's the only of the red entries that are non-snake bite victims occupying these hospital beds. And the reason is because those hospitals that have antivenom become informal referral centers and people flood in from miles. The two hospitals that we've got, people are coming in northeast, we're working with northeast Nigeria, they're coming in from Chad, they're coming in from Cameroon, spending 24, 48 hours to get these medicines. That's why you get these large uh, numbers in, in the beds. Um, and sorry, we'll go back there. We've just completed a, a study in Burkina Faso working with the uh, um, lymphatic filariasis MDA program, and 10 hospitals were asked to, to provide retrospective data over the last year. And the result, the most outstanding result, um, was that in 10, 10 hospitals over one year, 27,000 hospital bed days were consumed by snake bite victims. So, there is a difference between other NTDs which are 
often treated as outpatients, and snake bite. Snake bite occupies a lot, uh, consumes a lot of energy and funds from uh, these rural hospitals. I belaboured the point, but snake bite is an unavoidable hazard in, in places like Nigeria because people are bitten, are at risk at what, whatever they do and whenever they're doing it, night or day. And because the sore scale viper is such a dangerous snake, one in five people bitten by this snake will die if they don't get treatment. So these communities can't change their circumstances, can't reduce their risk from snake bite because they have no political voice. They have very, very inadequate uh, access to effective health care. And they don't have the income to change their circumstances. And that very poor situation was made a great deal worse by the cessation of any antivenom supply to that region in 2000. Why? What happened? What happened was this, a combination of effects. Antivenom is extremely expensive. It's not uncommon for an, a course of antivenom treatment to cost between $400 and $700. That's a lot of money for people earning less than a dollar a day. It's a lot of money for, for hospitals that have very limited um, drug budgets. Antivenom also causes adverse effects. That's because you're giving horse or sheep IgG directly into the bloodstream of a human, you're going to have adverse effects. Um, in 50% of your patients, this is mild. Antivenom is also ineffective against these tissue destructive effects of venom. And so you're losing now the confidence not only of the physician who's treating the patient, but also the victim themselves. Um, and that confidence, loss of confidence, has ramifications but it's also compounded by economic factors. Africa is the only continent um, worldwide that is completely dependent upon the manufacture or the delivery of antivenoms from commercial supplies. South America, more or less without exception, have governments that uh, sponsor antivenom production and sponsor antivenom delivery and provide it free. And that's why the case fatality rate in, South, in Latin America is so much lower. Antivenom is expensive to manufacture, the demands of governments are poor for all the reasons that I described up here. And so the production of these two really good antivenoms out of Europe stopped. Two companies decided they were not going to continue the manufacture of antivenom because they were such loss makers. And so the antivenom supply to Nigeria came to nil. We were, oh, sorry, and, and one of the ramifications of this lack of supply was the influx of a number of antivenoms that were manufactured with snakes that were not from, with venom from snake, from non-African snakes. Um, they were retailed at one-tenth the price of really good antivenoms. So Favafrique, this is one of the antivenoms that, that was ceased, the production was ceased. But these cheap antivenoms were ineffective and all they had did was increase the case fatality from 1.8 to 12.1%. This antivenom, this report was from Ghana We've seen it in Nigeria, we've seen it in Tanzania, and just two weeks ago, we saw, also saw it in Kenya. This highly dangerous antivenom that people think is a, a physician thinks is effective is very, very dangerous, and it's flooding sub-Saharan Africa. So there is a great need, urgent need, for quality control regulation of antivenoms before they're used in humans throughout sub-Saharan Africa. In response to a request from the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Health and in collaboration with, with groups uh, in the uh, two doctors, Nasidi and Durfa, in the Ministry of Health in, in Nigeria, we in Liverpool and Professor David Warren in Oxford then responded to this crisis of antivenom supply in Nigeria. What we did was we imported the three most uh, medically important snakes from Nigeria into our facility in Liverpool. We extracted venom from those animals. We provided those venom stocks to five different groups worldwide who had very generously agreed to use their spare manufacturing capacity to see if they could make antivenoms for Nigeria. And it was worldwide. It was UK, Costa Rica, Egypt, Mexico, and Colombia. We preclinically tested all of those in a mouse model to, to determine efficacy. Uh, three of those antivenoms then went forward into the largest... Uh, Human, trial of, of, human clinical trial of antivenom ever conducted, supervised by Dr. Habib and, and Professor David Worrell. 
One antivenom was withdrawn rapidly because of adverse effects. Um, that left us with two antivenoms, one a polyspecific against all three snakes and one a monospecific against a source scale viper. We delivered, we created those antivenoms, we tested them, they were effective, but we decided that was actually not enough. So this is Kaltungo Hospital in Gombe. We constructed snake bite wards. This was important because that meant that the training of physicians, here's Prof. Worrell uh, in the process of, of discussing a case with Dr. Abu Bakr that he trained. Um, so the training of physicians meant that those physicians trained in the expert management of snake bite would stay in the snake bite ward. They wouldn't get lost in the A&E elsewhere in, in the hospital. Um, and it was also not only clinical management, but also the surgical management of snake bite, quite specific. Um, we also purchased two ambulances to accelerate snake bite victims to, to, to hospital. There's a very clear association between the rapidity of treatment and the outcome of antivenom treatment. We provided those while we had the funding free to patients. The antivenom was very effective and had very few uh, adverse effects relative to other antivenoms. And that word got out. It spread, as I said before. People came in from Cameroon, from Chad, from all over uh, northeast, North Nigeria to get it. So these figures are, are way old. Now, um, we were getting over 3,000 uh, patients per year in Kaltunga and Zanko hospitals, and sometimes between 35 and 40 patients admitted per day into these hospitals. We have delivered in the last, so the, the, between 2006 and 2011, 37,000 vials equating to 18,500 life-saving treatments, which has substantially reduced deaths without doubt and, and morbidity. Um, the problem is that there was major political changes in, in Nigeria in, in 2012 in the ministry. The new minister uh, was reluctant to continue with this program despite its successes. And also um, the, the terrorist activities of Boko Haram had a massive effect on the continued operation. So civil changes, political changes can make an enormous difference and have done to this project. There is therefore a need, an urgent need for effective advocacy to improve the recognition of the snake bite public health burden by international health agencies and governments to affect policy change and also for research to develop better tools. And by that, I mean, I think there's, there's enormous opportunities to improve the way antivenoms are manufactured because of this. This is a 10 ml, most vials of, of antivenom are, are 10 ml. And um, that's, the, that's the dose, uh, for instance, that we give for, for Ekitab G. It's one of the few antivenoms where you only require one vial to effect um, complete cure in, in over 85% of your patients. And if you give two vials, it's 100%. It's a really great antivenom. But take a look at this. Actually, it's really poor because only 10%, between 10 and 15%, of IgG in a vial of antivenom is specific to venom proteins. So that means 90% of your drug is completely redundant and all it's doing is contributing to the level of adverse effects in your patients. Right? Now, when you take a look at the venom proteins, it's quite clear that many venom proteins aren't pathogenic. And so of your 10 ml, maybe only 0.5 ml is actually effective at, at neutralizing pathology. So there's a huge redundancy in this system that we think can be tackled by science. The other thing that you need to know is that the efficacy of, of current manufactured antivenoms is restricted to the snakes whose venom was used in, in, in its manufacture. So this antivenom made against the source scale viper is very effective against the source scale viper, but is absolutely useless against bite by mambas or cobras. However, in countries like Afri continents like Africa, you have a pretty large number of snakes. So we know that throughout the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, if you wanted to make a good antivenom a applicable anywhere, you'd have to 
inject your horses with over 20, with venoms of over 20 different types of snakes. That's massive. Um, and this is the problem with that. So the greater the need to make a polyspecific, multi-country anti-venom, the more venoms that you need to give to, to immunize your, your, your horses with. The problem is the venoms are very complex in terms of their protein composition. And each of these proteins is going to give, give rise to a different and IgG specificity. So you can see, if you're giving three venoms, one, two, three, then you're probably immunizing between 50 and 100 different proteins. And you're asking the poor horse to make its immune system to make antibodies to each of those different proteins. Something's going to give. So the, what it does mean also is that there's, there's less IgG for each snake to treat your patients. So to overcome that, what we do in the field is we give more vials of antivenom. So the greater the number of, of snake venoms used, the greater number of antivenom vials required for treatment. Unfortunately, the greater the number of antivenom vials you give, the, the greater the, the the more precipitous the drop in safety, the greater the adverse effect list. And here patients suffering from the pruritus and the abdominal colic that are so sustained uh, in, in victims that suffer from this. And also, of course, of course, I beg your pardon, the more vials you give, the greater the cost to the patient. So it's, as I said before, it's not uncommon for, for treatments to require three to five hundred, seven hundred dollars. This we, we came across a family in Kenya that who's whose livelihood was wiped out because they had to sell all their goats to pay for the antivenom to treat their children. So that family is now destitute as a result of the way antivenoms are manufactured and the fiscal and, and safety implications that follow. There's an urgent need, therefore, for, for research to develop antivenoms that, that are much better um, in terms of, of, of efficacy safety and affordability, and yet retain the polyspecific effectiveness. And that's what we're trying to do. So these, this describes the, our sort of research um, priorities, improves the efficacy, the cross-species clinical effectiveness, affordability and safety, and also develop a treatment for venom-induced tissue destruction. I'm going to go through those approaches very briefly. Starting off with dose efficacy, we want to change and a vial of antivenom said that every single IgG in there is effective at neutralizing a protein that causes, a venom protein that causes pathology. And this is the way we're going about it. This is the first study that we've done on this. And it's, it's targeting all the source scale vipers in, in sub-Saharan Africa. This is their range. There's three main different species that we're targeting. What we're doing is following a genetic approach, a molecular approach. First of all, we isolate all the genes from the snake venom glands to create what's called a transcriptome. So this is the description of all of the transcripts, the RNA transcripts, in the venom gland of a source scale viper. We then are able to interrogate that data and make a, a, a decision based on literature and on um, toxicity data that it's only these, the genes, the proteins encoded by these genes that we need to worry about. All these others are are genes encoding non-pathogenic proteins. So we focus on this lot here. And what we've done then is take a look at all of the sequences, converted them with algorithms into ways that we can look at the predicted immunogenicity of domains within each group. So this is all of the protein, sorry, all of the genes coding for metalloproteinases, one of the most dangerous venom molecules around. Uh, and we are looking now at them in terms of their domains within them that are likely to be immunogenic. And where they're conserved across different transcripts, we are taking those out. We're identifying them. Because the point being is that if we can make an antibody to this, it will bind to that domain irrespective of which protein it, it, it comes from, it's present in. And we pull out those, we remove those sequences, stitch them all together, and we've now, these different epitopes now, 
are then used to immunize a, a mouse. And we want to, to, to get the antibody back from these mice. And what we have found is that once these mice generate the antibodies against the, it's called an SVMP, SVMP epitope string. And we looked at whether it was effective in, in, a, in a model. And this is a rather horrible model, but it's the only one we have to measure um, hemorrhage induced by venom proteins. So here we mix the venom and, and the test substance, this time PBS, with, uh, together and then inject it into, into the dermal uh, skin of the mice. 24 hours later, you look at the extent of the dermal lesion, the hemorrhagic lesion. You can see here it's huge and it's very, very florid. Take a look now at the same amount of venom, but this time pre-incubated with IgG from these uh, epitope string immunized mice. And you can see there's an over 80% reduction in the size of the hemorrhagic lesion, but also the floridity, the, the severity of the hemorrhage. So a single immunogen has been created that neutralizes the most, pathogen the most lethal effect of this virus. Encouraged by that, we decided to continue this project, but this time expand it from the snake venom metalloproteinases and go for these other very dangerous groups of venom proteins. And we did this now in, in a slightly different variety, so this was just with, with recombinant proteins. And what we wanted to find out is, can we make these epitope strings that are producing IgGs that are toxin-specific, because that's central to our thesis. And what we have here now are all of the venom proteins in all of the source scale vipers of sub-Saharan Africa. And we also threw in here some snakes that are not source scale vipers, um, but there are, are, they are vipers. So that's just what the protein content looks like. The next series of slides is what those proteins are, which of these proteins are bound by the IgG that we've raised in mice immunized with the epitope strings. And they should be specific. There should be clear differences between each panel. And there are. So this is the epitope string one against metalloproteinases. You can see that there are some similarities, but also that there are very clear differences. And that's very different also from the serine proteinases. So what we've been able to do here by carefully designing this immunogen, we've generated IgGs that are specific and binding to exactly what we're, they're supposed to do. And we've done that for all of the major toxin groups, as, as illustrated here, and looking at this specificity. Now, the next step then was to combine all of these IgGs. So we now have a com combination of anti-SVMP, anti disintegrin anti-PLA2, anti-CTL, anti serine anti proteinase, all combined and all used to decorate the same array of proteins. And you can see here that there, virtually every protein in the venoms of these source scale vipers is bound by this pool of toxin-specific antibodies, and that there is some binding to other uh, proteins in these other vipers, because there's some similarity from viper to viper. Look now what happens when you compare this array with that, with Ekitab G, the antivenom that we uh, uh, made for, for uh, Nigeria. And in terms of the ECIS, actually, they're very, very similar. So by immunizing mice on three occasions, so there's nowhere near the, the, the strength of, of the antivenom where you're immunizing sheep on a monthly basis for over a year and a half. Um, so we are really encouraged by this. Unfortunately, because it's a mouse model, we did not have enough IgG to determine where its efficacy in, in uh, neutralizing the lethal effects of, of snake bite. But we're really encouraged by this. We also know that what we have to do is expand this approach to the, all of the venom proteins in all of the snakes of Africa. And that's something that we're working up into a grant application at the moment, so that we have continent-wide efficacy. And we feel that it has to be a monoclonal antibody uh, in nature, and it should be humanized. But if we can achieve that, we'll increase the dose efficacy by over 90%, because every IgG in this vial will be toxin-specific. 
and that means that it'll be highly effective because it'll be humanized, there'll be no adverse effect risk whatsoever. If we can achieve all that, I think we can get pharma interested in, in taking this on as, as a commercial product, and that's critical, um, because otherwise it, it may not be effective. And if it's that good, I think demand will be very, very significantly higher than it is at the moment. That's the rationale behind it. Um, what about snake bite tissue necrosis that I want to f finish with? This is a, 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 affects three times the number of people that die from snake bite, at least. Um, so in sub-Saharan Africa, it's estimated that 100,000 people survive with, that survive snake bites are suffering conditions like this. Um, so this is a nine-year-old girl bitten by a, a cobra in, in uh, northeast Nigeria. Uh, the tissue was debrided. These keloid contractures uh, developed that has completely malformed the fingers of her hand. Uh, two weeks ago, we saw a virtually identical thing in, in, in Kenya. So it's happening all over the place. Um, amputations are, are not uncommon. It's estimated 8,000 amputations are performed on snake bite victims every year in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there is no medicinal treatment, IgG that's effective against the lethal effect uh, in the systemic circulation is ineffective against this. It's too large a molecule to rapidly cross from the blood where it's intravenously delivered to the tissues to negate this type of uh, pro progression of, of, of uh, tissue destruction. So surgical debridement and amputation is the only recourse to, to deal with this. Um, Therefore, there's a compelling and, I think, really urgent need for research to do something about it, to come up with an alternative. And we're following a, a route through, through uh, CAMELD using the unique uh, immunology of CAMELs. We all have, all our immunoglobulins are heavy and light chain. These are large, 150 kilodaltons. CAMELs are unique in the animal kingdom, except for uh, nurse sharks, in that most of their IgG is <clears throat> lacks light chains. In us, that's a severe disease, but in camels, that's no problem at all. Pass. Yeah? What's really interesting for us is that this moiety that binds the foreign protein, the VHH, is, is in only 15 kilodons. It's one-tenth the size of conventional IgG used to treat snake bite patients. So we figured, we considered that if we could make an antivenom consisting of this, then we might have something to work with. And we entered into collaboration with the Central Veterinary Research Labs in Dubai. Here's Uli in injecting the animals and Jorg uh, extracting the, the blood from uh, venom immunized camels. Don't worry about this, I just wanted to emphasize that we'd put a lot of work into it. It's, it's over a year's uh, immunization. And of the polyspecifically immunized camels, I want you to focus on this, this one camel here, which is this fellow. Um, and what we did is we extracted the IgG, the total IgG from this animal, and we then purified out just the heavy chain only IgG, and then fractionated the VHH using papain um, as well. And we compared these three camel IgG entities with the most effective antivenom in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the South African product, in their ability to neutralize the lethal, the hemorrhagic, and the coagulopathic effects of the source scale viper. And bear in mind, when you look at these figures, the, the more effective it is, the lower the, the, the amount needed. And you'll see that the VHH is gram for gram, microgram for microgram, five times more effective than, than the total IgG, and three times more effective than antivenom, the best antivenom in Africa, ditto in neutralization of hemorrhage, ditto in uh, neutralization of coagulopathy. This is by far and away the most effective antivenom ever devised. But you'd expect it, because it's got 10 times the, IG, the, the IgG, the, the binding valency, than any of the other antivenoms, because it's so small, because it's only 15 kilodons. And we were really keen, because we think that 15 kilodons, it'll have the same tissue distribution dynamics as the venom proteins, right? But, and there's always a but, because there has to be, because that's where your net grant is coming from, um, we need to resolve the problem of the very low yield of VHH from, from IgG. It's, it's terrific. It's not commercially viable. 
And so what we're going to do is clone the genes from here that make these uh, VHH from the camel B cells and make them as recombinant proteins. Yeah? The next thing we need to do is to make them only specific, these VHH, to those venom toxins that cause necrosis. Many venom proteins don't, so we can make it toxin-specific exactly the same way that we're doing for the systemic approach. And then finally decide upon a, v a delivery route. It's absolutely clear that you could not deliver a 15 kilodalton VHH into the blood circulation and expect it to last any length of time at all. It'll be cleared in 20 minutes. So we need another system for delivery, something that overcomes it but delivers the VHH direct to where it's needed in, in the tissues. So I've overcome my time, but basically we are following a number of different routes to try and come up with better drugs to treat snake bite um, because that's what we, were, we think is needed with improved demand. Um, we're calling these the next generation snake bite therapies because we think someone told us that that has the right ring to it to um, get the Wellcome Trust's attention. <laughs> so key points really are that I wanted to, to make here today is that snake bite is an important, it's a neglected disease of the rural poor in, in Africa and Asia. We desperately need more accurate data on mortality, morbidity and socioeconomic impact to understand disease burden and to use that disease burden data to raise awareness amongst governments and international health agencies um, so they actually recognize it as a deeply neglected uh, tropical disease and they start doing something about it. We know that current antivenom therapy can be effective, but there's lots of problems with it in, in terms of, of uh, improvement. We certainly need better regulatory control. And until new drugs, new next generation uh, antivenom drugs come around, we need urgently the investment by governments and international health agencies in the production and delivery of these conventional antivenoms, but in much larger scales, to stop the deaths. Snake bite deaths is completely preventable. Give antivenom and we'll stop those deaths. We need to establish regional training centers on the clinical management of snake bite. That's absolutely clear from our experiences in Nigeria. It's very, very important. Snake bite is a very specific, very complicated thing to treat. Um, and we need governments and international health agencies to support the development and delivery of effective and affordable antivenoms. And finally, just to push for the scientists, we need more funding for, for, for these new, new, new tools. Um, I'd just like to thank all the various people that have been involved in this project, both within my own institute at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in Central Veterinary Research Labs in Dubai, in the Ekitab study group in Nigeria and UK, and the Kenya Snake Bite study group that we've just started in there, and various fundings. So thank you very much. Thank you.